welcome to um, uh, Opportunities to Increase Resiliency in Minnesota's Food System. This is our second policy forum of our 2020 series. Um, and as I said, my name is Lily Benowitz. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a program manager at Environmental Initiative. Um, and I'm going to open us up with a couple of welcoming comments, getting us oriented to the room, um, and then we'll dive into the day. Um, so to start, um, I want to acknowledge that we're convening this space for Minnesota, the homeland of the Dakota people, um, where the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples, as well as other indigenous people from other tribes, um, tribal nations currently reside. Indigenous people are still here and are thriving. Um, this acknowledgement calls us to learn about the histories of the land we convene on and to seek understanding and understanding and inclusion of indigenous perspectives in our work, especially as we build towards a healthy environment and equitable society. We ask that you say hello in the chat um, with who you are and where you're calling in from, including the native lands that you're on if you know. Um, if you don't, we just dropped a link in the chat um, where you can look up um, where you are and the native land that you're on. So I will give everyone a couple of minutes to introduce themselves in the chat um, and welcome everyone. Awesome, so yeah, keep entering um, who you are, where you're calling in from into the chat. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about who Environmental Initiative is. Um, so for all of you who don't know us, Environmental Initiative strives to catalyze collaboration across perspectives, power, and systems for environmental equity or sorry, social equity and environmental health. Um, we are committed to centering equity in our work because we understand that environmental the environmental challenges we face today are inextricably linked with economic vitality and social equity and one cannot be addressed without the other. Um, you see on the screen right now, um, we just completed a strategic planning process um, and our board approved this new strategic plan um, about a month ago. So we're um, still living into what does this mean for us um, and how will this impact our work. Um, but we wanted to give you all um, a preview and um, exposure into kind of who we are and what we're thinking um, our purpose in the world is right now. Um, I want to take a moment to thank all the people and organizations who have made today's event possible. We believe the most generative ideas come from collaboration and our policy forums are no different. Um, we hone these events through talking to lots of our partners about um, what they think might be interesting, what is the particular intersection of ideas um, that would be great to lift up. And so wanted to give a shout out to um, those that we had conversations with um, in both a planning group and in one-on-one -on -one conversations as well as our speakers for helping to inform today's event. So they're all on the screen, so thank you to all of you. Um, and we also want to take a moment to recognize our sponsors for this event. Um, our presenting series sponsors are Dorsey and Whitney and Wink. Um, and today joining us from Dorsey and Whitney is Brian Bell, and joining us from Wink are Katie Swar and Peter Miller. We're so happy that all of you can join us today. Um, we also wouldn't be able to put together today's event um, without our wonderful speakers. You'll get to hear all, from all of them in a little bit, um, but they also took time before this event to pre-record a conversation um, with us that if you haven't had a chance to listen to it, um, we would love for you to tune in. That'll be sent around with the follow-up information from this event, uh, but they both had an animated conversation then and we'll dive into more details today around application. And so the two conversations together um, create some wonderful ideas or bring out some wonderful ideas. Um, and so wanted to give a thank you to them for taking the time to create both of those with us. Um, so a couple of notes to orient you to our virtual space. So for the event today, um, in a couple of minutes, we're gonna break out into some networking breakout groups. You can learn who's in the room. Um, then we'll hear from our speakers, um, both with a panel and then some time for Q&A with everyone in the room. Um, and then an uh, additional breakout room um, with some application-based reflection questions that you can have with other participants. So giving you more relationship opportunity, building opportunities, and then also thinking through wow, there were so many great ideas that were talked about today. How does that apply to, to my work and um, the impact I can make in the world? Um, and then something that's new for us with these policy forums, we're you know, going fully online for the first time and so trying new things um, each time. And we will be holding the Zoom room open from 10.30 to 11 if you wanna stick around to build, build additional relationships um, after the formal event has closed. Um, so some of our staff will stick around. You're welcome to join us. Um, and yes, that will happen from 10 at 10.30 to 11. 
Um, in terms of being on Zoom together, um, we invite you to hover over your name in the participants list to update um, your account with your organization um, or your name organization and then your pronouns if you feel comfortable. Um, and we also ask that you keep your audio muted um, and that you share your video if you're able. We love to see who's here. Um, and in the case that you would share, you're welcome to unmute at that time. Um, we'll also be alternating between sharing slides and being in gallery view just to maximize um, each person's viewing experience. Um, and then um, two more pieces are that um, this conversation will be recorded so that we can edit it down, like taking out the breakout groups and things like that to share out afterwards. Um, and that you can follow along the conversation on social media. Um, the, um, our, our Twitter handle is at the bottom as well as the hashtag we'll be using throughout the event. And we um, are excited to have a conversation in the room on social media and following the event. Um, you know, through one-on-one -on -one connections and then also online. So without further ado, um, welcome to the event. And we are gonna break out into some um, networking breakout rooms um, with about three to four people so you can get a sense of who's here. We invite you to share who you are, um, your pronouns if you feel comfortable, um, and what brings you into the conversation. Um, and we also like to, you know, include a couple of event norms for those smaller group um, conversations just to make sure that we're all you know, aware of how we all want to show up together. And so a couple of things I'll pull out um, are um, that there's a kernel of wisdom in everyone's story and experience. Everyone has a lot to contribute to the conversation. Um, and then this idea of move up, move back, of um, share what you can, share what you feel excited about, and notice that if you're sharing a lot and other people haven't had a chance, make space for them to share. And if you haven't been sharing as much, take space to share what you want to share in, in um, your small groups. So um, with that, um, I will have Malia whisk us away into breakout groups, and we'll see you in about um, nine to 10 minutes. Malia, do you want to just dive in once everyone's back? Sure. <clears throat> and I think, that, I think that officially makes it all of us. Um, great. So I hope everyone was able to Hope meet someone new or have a good chat. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna move into kind of our panel discussion. Um, and before we do that, I just wanted to say a few quick words about our topic for the day. Um, so, you know, and those of us, those of you, sorry, who, who joined us for our first policy forum uh, a few weeks back have heard this already, but uh, you know, in general, we really try to focus these forums on really timely topics. We usually choose something that relates to environmental decisions that are happening in the state uh, kind of in real time. And so probably no one would be surprised that when we surveyed uh, recent attendees of our policy forums in May, people really universally indicated that they were interested in hearing about impacts of changes in the economy on environment and environmental decision making. So how those things connect. Um, and one of the probably most immediate ways that many of us felt the economic impacts of the pandemic was as participants in the food system. And uh, for those of us there, you know, for, for anyone who isn't a member of the production or distribution side, um, which many of you are, uh, all of us certainly are food consumers. So for those of us who had the luxury of eating out of the house a lot, we suddenly shifted to cooking more and eating at home. Uh, for others, food insecurity became an issue that we had never expected to face. Uh, many of us participated in food drives through local schools and churches, especially after civil unrest over the killing of George Floyd left large swaths of South Minneapolis, where I live, uh, without operable grocery stores. And despite a strong production system, consumer behaviors and needs changed, I think, just so quickly uh, that existing vulnerabilities in our supply chains became much more visible and probably new vulnerabilities opened up that might not have occurred to us outside of a crisis. Uh, but we also know that um, this, this may not be the last, you know, that, that those vulnerabilities are things that we want to look at and address. And so thankfully we have a really um, amazing set of four leaders with us here this morning. who have been thinking a lot about what makes for a resilient food system and how to build more resiliency into the systems we have. So I'm excited to have a conversation with them and with all of you. We have a lot of, a lot of other folks as participants who also have been thinking a lot about this. So um, during the panel, and actually particularly given that Again, so many of you 
um, our, uh, our participants and, and bringing different perspectives to this. Um, we'd love to have a, an active chat going during the panel and please feel free to add questions there as they arise um, for the panelists, for each other. Lily's gonna keep an eye on the chat as well and just help me make sure that any questions that you put there um, make it their way ultimately to the, to the panelists if that's something that you'd like to do and make sense. And, um, and like I said, that I think it's a great space for, for conversation as well. Um, and then as we go, we can also figure out, you know, at the end, we'll have at least 10 minutes for questions. And if people want to just raise hands too, we can, we can do that. There are a few enough of us that I think we can find you and um, make sure you have a chance to speak to. Uh, so for our four panelists, the thing we're going to start with uh, is, is introductions. So I'm going to have each of you go around and I'll just call on you alphabetically by first name. But if you could just start with who you are, what brings you to this conversation, and what building a more resilient food system in Minnesota means for you. And I think that puts Eric up first. Good morning. Um, my name is Eric. Uh, I farm near Malacca, Minnesota. And uh, resiliency in the food system to me means more people on the land. All right. Thanks, Eric. Lillian. Good morning, everybody. Happy to be here. Um, my name is Lillian Otieno, and I work for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Produce Safety Program. And for me, um, with the work that I do, which is outreach, uh, I think for me, it's more about um, the diversity of uh, our farmers, uh, the diversity in geography, in race, ethnicity, uh, products, um, language, uh, and making sure that uh, we have an inclusive um, system to address the inequities that exist in the farming system. I think that leads us to resiliency. And thank you. Thank you. And despite teaching a first grader in my spare time, I seem to have forgotten my alphabet. So, uh, so I'll backtrack to Kay. So Kathy, Kathy, why don't you go ahead? Good morning, everybody. Thank you. I'm glad to be here as well. Um, and my name is Kathy Drager. I am the statewide director of the U's Regional Sustainable Development Partnership. I'm also an adjunct professor of agronomy and plant genetics. And um, I live and farm in Big Stone County, Minnesota, which is on the far western edge of the state. You know, on the, there's that bump on the western edge. So I live in the bump and a farm here. We raise um, organic grains and beans. So this year we raised millet. We raise barley, edible beans. Um, we also do grass fed beef and um, our farm is entirely powered with a farm scale wind turbine. Um, so I, I, I'm lucky to have a, a laboratory for the, the academic side and then I have a laboratory where I can also see how things can work um, on the landscape as well. And then I also study our soils. I'm a soil scientist by training as well. So I'm very interested in solutions to climate change and where agriculture fits in to climate change. So I'm able to really see what is making an impact on my farm in terms of soil carbon capture. Um, um, I kind of digress. Um, I just want to say one thing that's in my background is that I at one point was a, um, a principal in Wank Engineering, which I don't even actually include on my, on my resume anymore. So to everybody here from Wank, I wave a say hi to you all. And uh, that was a, an interesting, interesting uh, 13 months of my career. So um, what, what makes our Minnesota, I'm gonna use Minnesota. Um, I know it goes beyond Minnesota. In fact, it's, I think some of the things that would make Minnesota agriculture resilient are also kind of somewhat true around the world where the majority of farmers are small farmers actually worldwide and the majority of food is actually provided by small farmers small small land owners around the world um, so i agree with uh for example that uh diversifying farmers just like you'd want to diversify any portfolio you know the old saying you know about putting all your eggs in one basket, um, diversifying any holdings that you have. We're safer when we have 
a degree of diversity. Diversity and resilience um, go hand in hand. And so I think diversifying our landscape, <clears throat> looking at um, one of the things I look at academically is how do we go from research to consumer, take a whole systems approach so that we're actually asking the right research questions that can help inform solutions on the landscape as well. And looking at it from research to farm to, you know, whatever that system is agronomically as well as supply chains to consumer. So I think this is going to be a, a good discussion and I think there's a, a lot of rich areas that will help build resilience in our food system. Enough said. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Tamara. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Tamara Nelson. I am from Sibley County, Minnesota from Arlington. And I have spent about 35 years working in agriculture and food policy, including international trade policy. I relocated to Minnesota uh, last year after 31 years being gone in both Illinois and in Washington, DC. And I am excited to be a part of this conversation. I'm very happy to see some of AgriGrowth's members here. We are a, a broad organization that uh, tries to represent and advocate for the entire food system from individual farmers to Fortune 500. So we have a ability to convene complex discussions and we really appreciate being a part of this one because diversity is is very important to our members large and small and also the connections that we can make within the food supply chain in order that you know food is equitably distributed and people have an equal opportunity to participate in the the wonderful work that we all do and because Really, in today's world, you, you have to have the diversity in the part of the uh, chain producing the products for the wonderfully diverse global community that we live in. So excited to be here and happy to see um, so many friendly faces. Thank you. Thanks, and I will also put out a quick reminder that um, for any of you who haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, the materials that got sent to you um, over the last couple of weeks to include a link to a recording with all of these wonderful panelists. And so we'll recap a little bit with these next couple of questions, some of what we covered in that, but there's also um, going to be a little bit of a difference between today's discussion and that. So I still encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to go back and listen um, to that discussion that we all had that's available via an audio file. So like I said, these next couple, um, for those who haven't had a chance to listen, we wanted to make sure just covered a little bit of, you know, first tell me about the relationship you see between diversification of farmers and farm products in Minnesota and increased resiliency, uh, both in Minnesota's food systems and in its natural systems. Kathy started to talk a little bit about that um, actually in those introductions as well. So um, maybe for the next cut at that, um, we can hear some from Eric. Hi. Yeah. So, um, you know, I said it pretty simply in my introduction that more people on the land is more resiliency. Um, but within that statement is kind of a, my overarching view on how we think about um, broad agricultural issues, um, judging from, you know, resiliency to economy. Um, but certainly any, any definition of resiliency is, is going to include things like uh, ability to withstand shocks um, when a system, you know, is handed something like COVID, how does it respond? Um, and what I believe we have in our current food system is false resiliency or like a manufactured resiliency that is, is supported by uh, absolutely gobs of our tax dollars um, that was created very intentionally to um, be a, a system for which uh, we could still have people making uh, commodity ingredients, uh, but that they wouldn't have to be really be paid for those ingredients. Uh, and, and they would be paid by way of, of large federal programs. Um, and as we've seen in the last four years, especially with this administration, the uh, decision to uh, double down on farmers producing food for less than the cost it takes to produce it um, and then just making up for that later with you know just checks 
um, direct payments um, is is just the natural conclusion, or I guess the natural next chapter of the uh, agricultural policy that has created this whatever resiliency it is that we're experiencing in our food system. You know, we we, we should be proud of the fact that uh, through COVID, you know, there was still food on the shelves. But we should be we should be um, you know concerned about how we accomplish that. You know, the ends of, of people being able to afford food is great, but the means of us getting there is something that I think needs to be examined, especially with new understandings of climate change, uh, social issues, civil rights. Um, the list goes on in ways that the current way of, of accomplishing our goal of, of feeding people um, is, is, in my opinion, uh, bad. Uh, disrespectful, inappropriate, um, poorly designed, inefficient, uh, and definitely not resilient. I'll, I guess I'll end on that as my adjective. William, did you want to add a little bit more in terms of some of what you brought up? <clears throat> yeah, so I think, thank you, Eric, for that. Um, Eric just <laughs> summed it up. Um, and I agree with everything that Eric said. I think you know, if you think about farming um, in our state, there is, of course, um, th th there are a lot of gaps that exist, right? Um, farming and the resources and uh, information that is out there is really more geared towards white males, right? Um, and so I think there's a reckoning right now that there is, um, there is a great benefit uh, for all of us to, to take take a look and, and ask ourselves, how is that working for us? Are we being inclusive, right? And I think we all know what that answer is. We're not. But on the flip side, I think um, there's a lot of work that is ongoing. Uh, the conversations currently in not just within Minnesota, but in our nation has, has triggered or awakened uh, something that uh, is not necessarily new, especially for uh, people of color, uh, indigenous folks, and uh, and others who have uh, traditionally been marginali marginalized uh, and have not really been represented in in the policies and the processes in programs that have been initiated to quote unquote support farmers. Those programs don't necessarily work for a majority of the diversity of farmers out there. So the relationship between diversification of farmers and farms in Minnesota is really beneficial in terms of, we have to be inclusive. We have to make sure that everyone is included in, 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 this, in, in this industry. And um, there's different palettes, right? We all have different palettes. Uh, we all have different, um, um, cultural uh, norms, values, mores. And that, uh, that in and of itself is our strength. So I don't see how we don't leverage those strengths to make sure that we are uh, providing um, Minnesotans um, a choice and also being wholesome in the way we approach farming in the state. So, um, I don't want to piggyback on what Eric said. Eric summed it all up, but structural institutional uh, racism uh, permeates uh, our society. It's been there in eons. We can't unpack those issues in a webinar, um, and we cannot unpack those issues or well, just within a, a segment or a year. It's going to take time, and it's attitudes, right? We can have we and we do have great programs and great processes in place, but why aren't they working? So let's go back and address the elephant in the room. And I think that is racism uh, in agriculture and in our food systems. Let's go back and look at those issues and be bold and intentional about addressing those and making sure that the face of agriculture is representative of the face of Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you. And we're gonna dig more into what are some of the opportunities we have to um, make those programs sort of more accessible, address systemic racism and sexism, sexism inside of um, the system in uh, just a minute. And before we do that, I did though wanna just kind of put on the table um, 
some of the ideas again that we had spoken about um, in our pre-recorded audio uh, about ways to build more flexibility into supply chains as consumer needs and interests are shifting in Minnesota. So um, what are some of the ideas out there? And then we can, like I said, talk more about some of the specific program and um, funding opportunities. So uh, maybe Kathy, you could kind of take a cut to it, kind of what do we need to do to make sure we build more flexibility um, into the system? So <clears throat> COVID-19 provided us an interesting experiment in how our supply chains held through a kind of a, a you know, local to global disruption in, in our normal supply chains. And I think, um, to be quite honest, I was very concerned. At the end of February, I was starting to have mounting concerns about what this um, pandemic could mean for our supply chains. Um, I will say that through those first months of this crisis, the supply chains held. We, we did have shortages. I'm still hearing of certain shortages. Um, you know, things were, th there were bottlenecks throughout the system for a number of products. Everybody knows toilet paper. Um, I was, I had conversations with grocer in Kansas that didn't have beef. All right, you all know that there's twice as many cows per capita in Kansas than there are people. And they were limiting beef, right? To one pound per family, per, Per, per visit, um, as well as, you know, like I said, spaghetti, for example, we were hearing not too many months ago that there was shortages in some places of spaghetti, which is something easy for people to cook at home. So, but I will say throughout this crisis, from where I sit and the wholesalers and the people I talk to in the supply chain, supply chains held, right? So we've gone through a crisis and supply chains held. There were um, shortages. I, I did get, you know, one call where a wholesaler actually whispered, was having a conversation and then sunk into a whisper, which when someone sinks into a whisper, it kind of, kind of gives you a little chill, right? And he was like, infant formula, infant formula is becoming very sensitive. Like he dropped into a whisper because I think he was concerned about the supply chain for infant formula at that point. Um, so, but we haven't heard a lot about that in the news and it eventually was resolved through, you know, some supplies. I don't have infants, so I'm, I'm actually was not a consumer. So I never experienced a shortage in, in that product. Um, so, but I think it also gives us a really good opportunity to look at and to really highlight how diversification of our local, regional and global food supply has a lot of values and can be very protective of communities um, locally and around the world. So just so you know, most of my work focuses on Minnesota. I do work into the Dakotas, you know, the work I do, it's, it, it's, there's some parts of it that were adapted a little more universally, but um, like my area of study is kind of this part, because when you're working with local and regional food systems, you know, there's a certain geographic place based emphasis on that. Um, so I, I would say early on, my concern was that there was going to be a lot of people that didn't have reserves of food when COVID hit. And, um, and so we did see a lot of draw on our food, our food systems, you know, not just grocery stores, but uh, uh, food shelves and other other places. Um, and so I just want to get back to the question, which is how we build more resilience into supply chains. And I will just give you a, one anecdote and then I hope that we can continue this conversation further. If you're growing squash or if you're growing organic edible beans, like I grow organic edible beans, it you have to find your own markets, right? So if I'm growing corn or soybeans, I can go from Big Stone County, which is a pretty sparsely populated place. There are probably six uh, grain elevators within 20 miles of my home that will buy my corn or soybeans at a known market price. I can check the market price on my phone and more or less know what I'm gonna get from our corn and soybeans and I can deliver it to an elevator. It is actually a very elegant system. Maybe Tamara's gonna to speak to this, but the corn and soybean system that we have established, it's mature 
and and there is um, there's a degree of elegance to it. And and for corn and soybean farmers, there's a degree of accessibility. Um, in Clinton, Minnesota, which would be the closest grain elevator to my farm, they really are even now discouraging people from bringing in wheat because they're so specializing on corn and soybean that they really are like, yeah, we can handle your wheat, but you know, mm, would rather not if we didn't have to. But it's a it's a farmer owned co-op. So they are, you know, they will handle that if you want to, but not like, oh, bring in your wheat, folks. We got a call for wheat. Um, so, but then think about if you're growing something like edible beans, I literally have to go out and find the buyer, the purchaser, get connected into the own, my own supply chain on my own. And, you know, luckily in Milbank, South Dakota, there is a buyer who will buy organic grains. Um, otherwise, the next closest place is Fargo, North Dakota. Um, and so just want to point out that when we look at our supply chains, we've really doubled down on our corn and soybean economy. And I would say in part that's at the peril of making markets that are accessible for other healthy, wholesome crops. And this is where diversity is important because diversity of farmers leads to diversity of knowledge, diversity of skills, and then we also have the opportunity for diversity of crops. Um, I can be quiet now, but one another good example of that is the halal and kosher meat market analysis that we did for Minnesota. And I saw that Ariel Kagan is on here. She's the lead author on that report that we published in January. Um, but we could talk about that as an example as well, if we want to talk about not just um, uh, crops, but also about access to healthy, culturally appropriate meat. But I'll wait until the next person has a chance. Great, thank you. And, and we will definitely, like I said, we're gonna come back to you to some of the specific opportunities. I did wanna make sure that Tamara also has a chance maybe to weigh in on both the question around sort of how we um, can create more fl flexibility in those supply chains, as well as I know to respond a little bit as the conversation's going on. So go ahead, Tamara. Sure, well, I can start on the flexibility and supply chain side. And I appreciate um, Kathy's some of her um, anecdotes and examples, um, you know, and I'll talk about this a little bit more on the policy side, but a lot of what we see in terms of, as she described, an elegant, more elegant supply or streamlined supply for corn and soybeans is that a lot of specialization occurs um, in agriculture, whether you're in Africa or Jamaica or the United States. Some of the specialization has roots way back in history. Um, to the types of, of soil or climate that they have there, you know, using coffee or um, citrus or uh, cacao as examples. Um, and so you see in the United States um, that very um, commodity driven um, corn, soybeans, wheat in certain areas, you know, maybe cattle, hogs, and turkeys and others. And the types of uh, trends that drove that, um, you know, maybe hailed back to Lester Brown in the 70s saying that we were going to have, you know, global food shortages and everyone must produce. And so you had this, this jump in and this expansion. And now we're in a very different place. We see many countries have improved their production. Um, many of them are seeking to be more diverse for the very reasons we're discussing. And so I would say, I think incrementally, um, we will see some shifting and that those types of shifts are really important because I, I cannot tell you how surprised I was to move from Virginia to Illinois and see how um, much less diverse their agriculture was than Minnesota's or Virginia's. But it was heartening to see how much it diversified in 20 years. It was still a lot of corn and soybeans, but they also went back to growing more wheat, to growing barley, to growing cover crops. And so I think there is a huge opportunity here. And I would say that I think one of the um, challenges is, um, and not to be critical of consumers, <laughs> but because we are all consumers, and we have probably all found ourselves maybe uh, adjusting our purchasing habits because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so where there 
was there were many supermarkets and individual convenience stores in Minneapolis St. Paul 40 years ago there was one in every neighborhood as I recall there are many less now and there are lots of big box stores and and nothing against big box stores but if you're a busy consumer and you you decide you only have one day a week to go get your things I mean the crowds at the Costco's or the Sam's Clubs or the Super Targets are just it's sort of unbelievable to me sometimes to see um, that for the price of convenience and the price of maybe large quantities that can be stored and maybe the price of some unique offerings that you can get all in one place so many people have been attracted to that and i hope one of the things we've seen through the pandemic or because of the pandemic is a little bit more coming home to home and seeing that you know, without our support, um, the local community places do not make it. Um, without some thoughtful attention to your food supply and your food availability, those local stores um, don't have your business. So I do see a huge opportunity here. And I guess to the real question of building more resilience, I think there's a lot of companies, large and small, that have realized you know, just in time inventory and efficiency is one thing and not having a wholesale breakdown of our supply chain is another. And so what I heard a lot of uh, from our own members a couple of weeks ago was we asked them, are you building more redundancy into your supply chain incoming and outgoing? And they said, oh, yes, we are absolutely. And we are seeking out new solutions um, for different product sources and also for different products that we can provide when food service closes and retail is demanding more eggs, we want to be able to provide that so we avoid uh, system shocks. And the only other thing I would say is, and if we can, we talk about later, great, but um, Eric referred to the, um, the policy in this country on food and, you know, it's, it's strangely um, ironic, but, you know, it was all written in the 30s after the Dust Bowl when people were, um, concerned about the food supply and then also lots of people were flocking to the cities for jobs and no one was staying in rural areas. It might have been a good idea at the time. It, it's not probably the type of uh, policy fixation we should have now and people in Washington always told me, be careful what you create in policy because it's so hard to change it. But I will say there have been incremental changes in in policy in agriculture they are going to eventually change it but it's a bit like turning the titanic and so um i know many of you have seen some of the prog that programs that have come in, in in recent years that are more towards um diversity of farmers diversity in size helping smaller farmers meet um, requirements of the food safety modernization act or, and or exempting and i think that the way to keep that change coming is for everyone that works in this space to continue to talk about that with legislators, with policy um, groups and advocates, because it is really important to have a diverse uh, agriculture and food system and, and it needs to be um, encouraged. And I think it's a really good time to do that. Thanks. And that was a excuse me, a perfect pivot to get then into some of those really concrete opportunities. And again, through the couple of conversations I've had with all of you, um, I, I, I've heard actually a lot of great ideas as far and things that are happening right now at the state level um, around uh, making the programs that we have more accessible, particularly figuring out how do we, uh, you know, how do we accomplish that diversification of the landscape and of our farmers. Um, so I'm hoping to just kind of throw it out to all of you. And like I said, I know I've heard all, specific ideas from all of you. Um, so maybe you can kind of just pop a hand up and, um, or just unmute yourself and go. Um, but some of those concrete opportunities um, that we have right now to addressing barriers to, um, for, for emerging farmers, for, for immigrants, people of color, and, and uh, for taking advantage of, of opportunities, like I said, to actually diversify the landscape as well. Kathy, I see you. you're going. Go for it, Kathy. And okay. All right. So, um, 
so what are some of those actual opportunities? Well, I mean, part of it is going to be access to farmland. And I, I did see Jan Joannides on here earlier, and I know they do have some, you know, that's a nonprofit that has a substantial investment in um, helping to create access to farmland for new and emerging farmers. Uh, our Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and I'm sure Lillian can speak to this, um, it, it, it is very committed, I believe, to supporting all people with aspirations to farm as well as farmers and University of Minnesota Extension, which um, in Minnesota is, I think we're like, it was formed in 1909 and really to work with children, you know, in large part, if you're familiar with 4-H, for example, um, which is, has an increasing a presence and is certainly accessible. It's, and, and if it's not, you know, let me know. Um, because that is the, the aspiration and the hope and the, the belief and the value is that the information you need to be able to farm should be available to you through your University of Minnesota Extension. Um, and I know I gave this example earlier on the, on the recording, but when I was a beginning farmer 12 years ago, um, I had a really great hay crop, more than I needed to feed my cattle, and I did not know what to do with hay. And it was actually a, a University of Minnesota extension that said, here are the four things, here are four ways to sell your hay, because I wouldn't know where to take my hay. I wouldn't know how to start to sell uh, a hay crop. So, so we do have some assets out there. So I think we need to recognize the assets that we do he have, and I see Jan Joannides just put um, a, a link in the chat for the farmland access hub. Uh, we do have existing assets. So I think the best place to work that eliminates a duplication of effort because I don't feel like we all have the energy or the resources to duplicate other work that's going on. So let's figure out what assets we have. Um, and I'll just kind of reiterate uh, one thing that that Tamara said is recognizing that that sometimes the asset might be a small town or a local grocery store. In my case, in the work that I do, um, I work a lot with grocery stores in communities with population 2,500 or less. Those are real assets in the food system. That was one of those sources of diversity. When, when grocery stores in the regional hubs ran out, uh, we literally had people driving to some of these small town stores because they had a slightly different supply chain, slightly different wholesalers, and, and have maintaining that um, diversity in those things. And it's still happening now. Uh, we had people from St. Cloud coming to get canning lids in Clinton, Minnesota, right? Because can, there was a nationwide shortage of canning lids, but some of these little towns still had them in stock. So, um, so let's recognize the existing assets uh, that we have, too. Great. I, I noted that Tamara's got to hop off in just a minute, so I'm hoping before, um, before you go, you can just maybe um, either share a thought on that and also maybe one, one quick takeaway for all of us, what's a step that we can each take in terms of cre creating resiliency in our food systems. Sure. Well, and thank you, Malia, and um, and everyone. And I do apologize for having to jump off. Um, it is. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Kathy's last comment because I noticed a lot of that too. Of actually knowing people in the Twin Cities that drove had to drive further away to get things they needed, um, especially after the um, the unfortunate death of George Floyd. Um, it it is a classic example of, you know, one of the trends where everyone sort of goes this direction and you see it happening, you see things getting bigger, you see products getting more consistent and you, you sort of have to adjust yourself to go out and find maybe what you're looking for, your, your local beef or your, um, your co-op vegetables or whatever. And you see the big and you understand it and you understand that for some people, even people that run small restaurants or grocery stores, that big box store, that's where they buy their products. That's where they buy their toilet paper, their paper towels, their peppers. And so you see it and you say, okay, I understand why that's there and I understand how it evolved and I understand why people go there. But you're still grateful that you have these other options. And I think where we are now is, um, 
not just, okay, I see and I understand and I see this and I'm grateful to have it as an option, but more of a holistic conversation about, you know, what does the really diverse and whole, and whole and comprehensive food system look like? And how can we together develop uh, the best policy alignment um, to do that? Because we know that if you create a policy, you know, a hundred years ago, that for somehow for agriculture, it's not, not going to be the one that works today. And so how do we A, make the right policies and how do we incrementally change policies? Because when you put in some kind of a subsidy program, it will last and it will be very hard to get rid of because lots of people make investments to try to make that program work for them. And I would say probably one of our huge opportunities here is to look at opportunities to um, work uh, to make the best contribution we can to ameliorating climate change through our systems. We can certainly look at um, incentivizing perhaps, if you're going to have farm programs, let's incentivize good practices um, and or practices that help either sequester more carbon or improve air quality or whatever it is incentivize those types of activities as opposed to just size. And so if you have to do that, you have to look at existing risk management programs, for example, and change them very much um, so that they allow risk management to work for a smaller farmer that might take the risk to start growing hops for Eric or, or with Eric or someone that decides I'm going to try a, um, a winter hardy uh, barley that another industry needs. And I do think that that will need a lot of the smaller groups that are working in this space to interact more with some of the more traditional um, farm sector um, advocates. And I think that conversation can really help us all see a way forward as opposed to it being seen as a conflict. Because I don't think it's a, it has to be a conflict. And I think many of the companies that had some supply chain shifts this year felt the impact of the big streamline. <laughs> and they saw where they had opportunities and they had product they could provide to other outlets. What was missing was that channel. And I'll just give out a, a huge shout out to the Department of Ag and the U of M Extension. They were absolutely critical in providing some of those things that were needed when the systems broke down, whether it was help with help with harvesting hogs or help with um, depopulating turkeys or whatever it was, they and they were connecting people to buyers and sellers. And that's really important and Kathy's mentioned it a number of times. And so I think we really have a huge opportunity here and I would say it'd be very interesting to have a conversation in, um, four to six months, depending on the timing, before the next farm policy discussion start, before the next farm bill starts, you know, let's, let's have a conversation about what, what a good structure for ag policy nationally looks like for Minnesota. We would always love to do that. Thanks, Tamara. Sure. I, <laughs> so, and thanks for joining us um, and, and getting in a little last word. Uh, as far as the question around what our opportunities are, and especially to support um, diversification in the system, this is a huge part of what you work on, Lillian, as well as Eric. So I want to make sure uh, over the next six minutes or so we hear from both of you. But Lillian, did you want to speak to that next? Yeah, so I think I, uh, I agree with everything that has been said. And I just wanted to mention that um, at the Department of Agriculture and my colleague, uh, Ariel Kagan, is here who is actually leading um, work on the uh, Emerging Farmers Working Group, uh, which I believe we have received over 100 applications. And I think um, the process is now trying to uh, go through those applications and uh, stand up that, uh, that committee. So for those who are not aware, the Emerging Farmers Working Group um, was initiated by a legislative request and really to uh, address some of the issues that are experienced by what we consider emerging farmers. And, and that definition for, for this working group is women, veterans, persons with disabilities, uh, Native American, Alaskan Native uh, folks, uh, communities of color, 
young and beginning farmers, as well as LGBTQI uh, farmers and, and many more. And it's not just necessarily folks who are new into farming, uh, but it's also folks who have been farming but are not traditionally in that pipeline to receive some of those uh, resources that, that they need based on either um, those, those characteristics that I have just uh, described. Um, so this, this working group is going to help inform um, the MDA uh, and it is going to actually be led by these, these groups of folks, these farmers who are emerging farmers. They are going to lead these this, this discussions and, and best uh, articulate exactly what are those issues and, and how do we address those issues? How can the MDA be responsive, right? To address those issues. And, and some of those common themes are, you know, we've talked about in, 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 in some of our discussions is access to land, uh, healthcare, discrimination and racism, which of course, you know, we're all aware exists, as well as education and training opportunities. Um, what is the market access for these small, mid-sized uh, operations? So there's, there's a lot in, 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 in all of that that uh, I think is, is, is a great platform. Um, and I choose to look at the glass half full uh, instead of half empty. Um, are we, uh, is it, 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 does that solve everything? No. Uh, are, are there things that we could do differently moving forward? Absolutely. You know, I wish, I wish that uh, the working group came with, with some um, monetary backing because one of some of the other issues are uh, compensating uh, farmers, especially emerging farmers for their time. And, and those are some of those inequities that exist, right? Those are some of the issues we are grappling with, not just as an agency, but you know, a, as a community when we are addressing racism and, and the inequities that exist in that. So um, I'm sure that that is a great opportunity and I encourage everyone uh, who is aware of folks or farmers who are in that group to uh, spread the word um, so that we have a, a lot of those voices. So I'm very proud of our agency for doing that and for continuing with that work. Um, we work with a, a lot of farmers. So, you know, think about an Amish grower who uh, is in Harmony, Minnesota, who I've, I've had the opportunity to work with a, a lot of Amish growers uh, who is interested in the farm to school pipeline, right? Um, those communities uh, do not use technology. And so how do you get that information out to them? How do you uh, get them included in this, um, in this big part and, and make sure that they are also uh, successful and, and um, contribute to the resiliency and diversification of, of, our, of our food systems? Um, they, that requires of us to go back and think outside the box and, and ask ourselves, how do we do that? You know, yesterday I was just in St. Charles uh, at the produce auction, uh, part of our continuing engagement with uh, Amish growers in that particular area on uh, how we're going to provide a training. And sometimes it's, 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 it's a lot of work, uh, but at the same time, it's, that is part of engagement. It's going out there and making sure that we are being responsive to the needs of, of, of all the diverse farmers. We have farmers um, who are uh, Spanish-speaking farmers. We have Hmong-speaking uh, farmers who, um, who are also uh, in this space. How do we make sure that all these farmers are represented in, in, this, in, this, in this big part? So the Emerging Farmers Working Group is just one, one piece uh, that I think our department is, is working towards at least uh, addressing some of those issues and uh, providing that platform. We have uh, mental uh, health uh, resources that are available out there and I'll include some of this uh, information later. Um, and we also uh, have other, you know, resources like a farm link, you know, and we're talking about land access, right? Um, that is just a small little way to try and see how uh, farmers who are looking for land, which of course land accessibility is a huge problem. Uh, how, how can we also be uh, part of that solution to, to bring, you know, to have that one-stop shop, if you will, uh, for those farmers who may not be able to access some of these resources. And then challenging our own state uh, agencies and programs, like I said before, we work in silos, right? Uh, how can we make sure that we are connected so that we reduce the burden 
for farmers, especially these farmers who are trying to, uh, who are not really in that traditional pipeline, for them, not the big ag, corn, soy growers. How do we uh, get ourselves connected so that farmers don't have to be pulling their hairs out in, okay, who, what, what's DNR asking here? What's the Department of Health asking? What's MDA asking? But how can we make sure that we are connected and, and serving these farmers in a way that, that meets their needs? Um, I don't want to take up all the time, but I'll, I'll let Eric chime in on that, on that as well. Yeah, let's hear from Eric and then also be thinking about, we will have a few minutes still for if people wanted to ask some direct questions before we go into breakouts. So yeah, go ahead, Eric. <clears throat> okay, well, I'll try to be quick. I, I, uh, um, taking some notes when um, Lillian was speaking and, um, I, I wanted to highlight something something special about the emerging farmers working group model is that it's it's um, centering the uh, impacted communities and identifying solutions for themselves. Um, is this is a uh, there's a lot of reasons that this is a good thing, uh, and there's a lot of recent experiences in our society where we've where we've maybe um, this is a generous way of thinking about it, but like where we where we've realized maybe that that you know people who are experiencing issues have, have, have the best means of identifying those solutions. Um, and so I'm very glad that the MDA is taking this step to, to create a group and, you know, we'll see who's on it and, and how it functions, but I'm hopeful that, 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 that this is a, this is a kind of a, a model uh, step in the, in the, in the, in the right direction. You know, it's, it's important for the MDA to be doing this because, uh, like all of our, um, you know, institutions, they they were created out of the system that we've been living in, which which has the the, the many flaws that we've discussed today, um, and and particularly to bring it back to resilience in our food system, we we don't have the luxury of only letting white males farm, uh, of only making it easy for white males to farm, of um, uh, it goes down the line. So a little anecdote that, that was part that, you know, we shared on the podcast portion, but I think is important because uh, I know not all of us have been able to listen to it yet. But the experience of me, a white guy going into uh, an FSA, which is the Farm Service Agency uh, office to apply for a loan or a grant um, is uh, what they expect to walk in the door. And then if you don't look like me in any way, uh, it's a whole other conversation. And it's a whole other situation. Um, the uh, challenges that we have are immense. And they're not even necessarily, like we were talking about earlier, necessarily just policy, because you can change policy as much as you want. But when it, a lot of decisions come down to individual people uh, who are out there on the landscape making these decisions about which grants they accept, which um, applications they approve for financing. Um, and those individual people can um, make decisions however they like. Uh, to a great extent. And so making the change down to a human level is, is a much larger process than even changing the policy level. Um, and so I think, you know, MDA making this thing is very important. Um, and, you know, we'd love to see some sort of effort like that from some of the federal programs that work with farmers. Um, and I think that all I'll say about that is it's very important that you vote uh, in a handful of weeks or we will not see that change at the federal level. Thanks, Eric. So, uh, like I said, we have a few questions. If anyone would like to, it probably the easiest thing is to to type something into the chat or just signal in the chat. Um, or if folks want to even chime in and comment, because I know that, like I said, many of you um, work across the food system yourselves as well, and I know have um, may have some things to add in terms of kind of what are our, our primary opportunities. The other possibility, if uh, great, I see. Yeah, you know, how do we how do we look at the whole system and um, really include urban farming and integrate urban farming? And and actually, that's a great question. And does anyone, you know, on on the panel want to comment on that and sort of how does it, how does urban farming fit into that um, picture? I'll just say something very quickly, which my idea of more farmers on the land doesn't just mean a rural land. So it's, 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 uh, 
That's all. That's all. I think I'll say that uh, I'm glad that question came up. And I think, Eric, it reminds me of when we had a discussion previously. And I think you mentioned something about, you know, your farm being considered a hobby farm. Um, it's, it's, I think it's the same thing with, with urban agriculture. I mean, I've been in conversations where, um, I guess for lack of a better word, some people struggle with uh, looking at urban agriculture as also viable and also um, uh, part of our food system that, that needs just the same recognition and support. And so for us at, at the MDA, I know for our produce safety program with our produce safety advisory group, we have folks who represent urban agriculture in that team. And why is that? Because we recognize that that is, that is a piece of that puzzle that is, that is important in terms of uh, farming in, in this state. And so they also help inform our program. And I think uh, it goes back to uh, land access and it goes back also to resiliency. It's, it's being able to think outside the box and, and allow uh, folks to be able to participate in, in, this, in this industry in a way that meets their needs. And sometimes, um, you know, those communities that are mostly in predominantly urban uh, settings do experience a lot of, a lot of these um, economic um, disparities, if you will, as well as uh, healthy food challenges and food desert, right, uh, in, in those areas. And I don't want to go down a rabbit hole on, on the impact of that. And also the, 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 the impact of, of health uh, that are associated with the lack thereof of having those, um, those uh, avenues to, to provide safe food to those communities. So I think it's really important and, and for all of us in agriculture to to, to think about that and, and, and continue to um, include as part of our programs and processes uh, and not urban agriculture and not look at that, uh, that niche as something that is not inclusive of our entire food system. And so um, there are a lot of issues that come with that. And I know urban agriculture uh, folks face a lot of challenges, um, but I'm hopeful that uh, for our community here and those who are listening, Let's, let's challenge ourselves to change our mindset and not look at folks who are farming in a maybe non-traditional way, including Eric's farm who, you know, hobby farm. It's not a hobby farm in my opinion. Uh, and have an agriculture as well. These guys are contributing in our food system. And so that is, that is my, my comment on that. That's great. So I think that's probably a great uh, segue to put us into groups where we can all apply a little bit of this to some of the things we're working on in urban and rural contexts. And I also just wanted to quickly note um, that uh, we have uh, a lot coming up in the chat, including resources that are there, and that's great. And actually, if um, if people can uh, uh, add things, and yeah, like I said, let, add links, what we'll do is we'll make sure we capture all of those resources out of the chat and include them in a follow-up email as well. All right. Great. So um, the idea is, and I think Rachel will drop these in the chat as well, um, but is to talk in your groups about um, what resonated with you about the conversation so far, what's one thing that, um, like what's a connection you see to your work in particular and something that you could start doing differently from this conversation. Um, and then one question that you still have um, about this topic. So starting in there and we'll be in groups of, I think two to four based on how the algorithms work um, in Zoom. Um, but Malia will whisk us away. Um, we hope you can stay for that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, at, um, whenever we wrap up that piece, we'll also have some informal networking space um, at the end that folks can stick around, um, continue the conversation as um, a full group, however big that group may end up being. Um, so, all right, we will whisk away whenever Malia whisks us away. As people are coming back in, um, and Lily's going to close us out, but I wanted to also just note, uh, we'd encourage folks just as you're, again, as you're coming in and just listening to close out, uh, maybe to uh, write down a key takeaway or question that you have from your discussion, uh, just a way, as a way to 
kind of firm it up in your mind and also um, we would love it if you do have questions or takeaways um, that you want to send us afterwards then we would happily like I said incorporate those or find ways to um, maybe look for resources associated with questions and our follow-up materials to come out in the next few days with that though i'll give it to lily to, to finish it up yeah awesome yeah so please feel free to add your questions into the chat um and i know also a question that came up in our group was around um, if there are suggestions for particular policies that like moments like think small shifts could be made in. So if you have ideas about that that sparked from your conversations, please dump that in the chat as well. Um, and we can send that out um, as some some recommended next steps of where to dive in um, deeper. So um, here we go. So um, I want to Ooh, I was going to read off of my script and then it went to full screen. So hang on a second. All right. Um, so yeah, I want to thank all of you who took the time to join us this morning, particularly our speakers. Um, I think this was, I learned a lot um, from this conversation. I hope you all did too. Um, I'd also like to thank our presenting series sponsors, Dorsey and Whitney and Wink one more time um, for your contribution to make sure that this can happen. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the Environmental Initiative Policy Team, um, which is Malia Hausnick, Christina Vang, Rachel Geisinger, um, Deborah Carter McCoy and Sasha Seymour Anderson. Um, we have been adapting like wild this year. And so it's been um, definitely a labor of love to put together um, this new format for all of you. Um, a couple of things to look out for. Um, in the next week, you should receive an email with the recording from today's discussion, our pre um, live webinar um, podcast, as well as um, a short survey with evaluation around um, the content. Um, as I've mentioned, we're we're changing, the, we're, we're adapting all the time in this new time of COVID. And so we really want to hear from you about what about this did you like? What would you have wanted more of? How can um, this content continue to become more valuable over time? Um, and so keep an eye out for that. Um, additionally, um, if you were hoping to connect with someone or meet someone that um, you weren't able to today, um, my colleague Christina um, can e-connect you. So um, Rachel will drop Christina's email in the chat. Um, but if you saw someone that you were like, oh, this person was someone that I wanted to connect with, and we would be happy to do an email introduction between folks so that you can make the connections you were wanting to make through this forum. Um, and as a reminder, please stick around if you have a couple of minutes, 30 of them, however many of them, um, to connect with um, whoever wants to stick around to continue the conversation. Um, I know that we opened up a lot of questions and um, you're probably hunger, hungry for more answers. And so hopefully we can find a couple of those together um, in our networking space. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and we hope you have a good rest of your day.